It's such an honor to moderate uh, this session with all of you. Uh, now, just to kick us off, uh, I'm going to try and set the context and then allow each panelist to make an opening statement, uh, you know, a quick opening statement. Uh, what I'll say is that at the turn of the millennium, uh, on October 31st in the year 2000, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution on women, peace, and security. And the resolution called on all parties to conflict to take special measures to protect women and girls from gender-based violence, particularly rape and other forms of sexual abuse in situations of armed conflict. Now, 16 years later, uh, we've come a long way, and we can say that there's been some progress, but yet gender-based violence is still widespread. But let's quickly turn it down to uh, Bineta. Uh, and I want to ask you, uh, you have worked to break down the barriers of, uh, to women's involvement in conflict management and peace negotiations. Uh, what do you think uh, has been the biggest contribution of women to conflict management and building sustainable peace? Let me just um, touch on a little bit first on the issue of accountability. Um, because I think this is one of the key issues. South Sudan, for example, for the first time, the African Union have uh, committed to investigate on uh, what is happening in South Sudan. There is a report available. But one of the key issues that we were investigating was the issues of rape within the crisis in South Sudan. And I think that is something that we need to look at and this is something that for the first time is happening in the continent to investigate ourselves what is going on. So now we need to push for the justice. That is where, because the facts are there, we know what has happened in South Sudan, but we make sure, we make sure that those who have perpetrated are brought to justice. Because this is what the people in South Sudan are asking for. So now the issue of the table, I'm linking it, because in the transformation of South Sudan, we wanted to see more women at the table, but so much barriers. Because the ones that have been invited at the table are those that have been holding the guns. That's the paradox, you know? So the women have to push to be at the table. They have to fight to come at the last minute even though we have the gender advisor in the negotiation, we have asked the mediator, because most of the time, the mediator doesn't have the mandate to consult as well the women's group or the civil society group. Most of the time, the resources mobilized are put on the perpetrators. Most of the time, it means that those who perpetrate those violence are the ones that are going to share the power. So what we are saying is, bring the women's group, they bring the issues of human security dimension at the table, sharing the responsibility and not just sharing the power. Because at the end of the day is, how many seats I'm going to have at the end of the day in the government, instead of saying, what is my responsibility? What is my responsibility if I will be the next leader of South Sudan or any other countries to make sure that, you know, you bring you schools with the resource of the country, health centers. So this is the discussion that the women bring at the table. So most of the time, we knock the door, the Burundi case, for example, that time, when the President Nyerere was the one and after President Mandela, the women came and the two parties said, but what are you doing here? You are not part of this negotiation. You should not attend this room. So it was not, not thanks to the, the, the leadership of President Mandela, the women will never come at the table. UN women did a big conference and we influenced and the discussion. I think Colombia is another example where women are playing a key role. We need to study how did they, you know, 
um, uh, at the end of the day succeeded to enter into the ballroom. So uh, DRC is another example. At the end of the day, you will see that women will participate, like in Liberia, participate in governance mechanism, contribute to rebuilding the, the, the country economy, restore, as I said, the dignity of the women. And I think by contributing, making sure that they are well represented, like the case of Rwanda, you will see that women pick up the pieces and reconstruct. So for the World Bank, I could understand that reconstruction in those countries, like Liberia, Sierra Leone, DRC, if they want the development plan to succeed, they have to invest on the women. And from the table, I think, to the program and the development program, the reconstruction program. So that's why we need to be at the table of negotiation. And in my side as facilitator, I always say it, the voice of the voiceless, those voice of the victim should be the driving force for an agenda for peace and reconstruction of any country. If they are not there, do it. When women have done the study, you will see those agreements will fail in the 10 years to come if the women are not sitting at the table. That's the reality. Thank you. Significant support to countries uh, that are experiencing. As, as, I, as I said, the, uh, the programs that we implement uh, that are focused on psychosocial uh, support or health care or others, that everything that we do from education to water uh, to agriculture all should be looked at uh, through a lens of what are we actually uh, trying to achieve here and what are the vulnerabilities uh, for the population. Uh, so USAID has, has that do no harm policy um, that we implement. We require all of our programs to take a gendered lens when we're actually looking uh, to how we actually award and implement. Um, and that we're, we think that doing things differently and actually empowering uh, how we see women and girls uh, is actually really fundamental. I think, you know, just to touch on really briefly that women and girls not looking at them not only as, as victims in a situation, but also looking at them as really important, strong agents of change, um, and, and, and looking for ways to not just prevent the violence or react to what happens if, if, if we're recovering from traumas. But well, thank you. Uh, I think that more and more uh, I'm hearing things like we should look at uh, women and girls not just as victims but actually as the champions of the change that we want to see uh, and I think that's a very important point uh, because when you look at them only with that lens of victimization then it doesn't bring out the power that they have to actually be resilient in fighting these challenges but I want to uh, before we go to the questions from uh, the, the audience I just want to go to, to Anne and say we've been hearing about you know what you've been saying about John Kerry and uh, uh, Secretary Clinton and all that they've been doing, and I just want to to, to ask you: uh, the U.S. has been one of those uh, countries uh, that has been uh, looking at gender-based violence as a significant problem among the displaced populations. And uh, can you tell us what the U.S. government uh, is doing, particularly uh, to, to to respond to this challenge? particularly the call to action roadmap on gender-based violence. What, what is the U.S. doing in that regard? Thank you for the question, and uh, three quick things about what the U.S. is doing and then a couple of other observations. Um, a lot of what we're doing is rooted in documents that were adopted um, at, at the National Security Council at the White House level um, to put together a plan for the entire U.S. government. So after 1325, we have the U.S. National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security, and the U.S. Strategy to Prevent and Respond to Gender-Based Violence Globally. And all of our work then is predicated on these important policy documents, and the um, world expert on them, Milan Revere, is here um, in the audience, so she knows far more about these things than I do. But um, inspired by these documents, then, the U.S. has done a couple of other things. One is that we uh, took over from the U.K. and for a couple of years led the 
international effort, the call to action to prevent uh, GBV, and um, helped organize other governments to make commitments and follow through on commitments um, to do more to uh, fight GBV. And that effort has been now inherited by Sweden, led by Zainab's um, predecessor, who is now the leading of feminist foreign policy in Sweden, Marco Wallström. And so anyone uh, listening to this or following this today uh, can uh, learn more about the call to action as a way to mobilize uh, governments to do more and uh, to make commitments, to follow through on commitments, to get involved. Um, my own personal piece of all this has been working with the Secretary to announce and uh, push forward a program called Safe From The Start that was focused on on the ground trying to ensure that the best lessons of how to keep women and girls safe were built into emergency response just from the outset of crises. Uh, I want to report to you where I think that effort is. We have um, provided more than $40 million to this. It has been joint with U.S. Agency for National Development. And I would say it's uh, like the um, AU Special Envoy said, it's, it's half full, it's half empty. I think that we've seen that things as simple as solar lights and the layout of uh, the path to the latrine can make a big difference in women's safety. An interesting piece too is that, that the symbolism of that creates an atmosphere where, and this I didn't expect, where women are more likely to take action or speak up when they see something bad happening because they know that as a camp has been pulled together that this is an important uh, piece of it. So um, I'm, a, I'm committed to continuing to work on this Safe From The Start initiative, and we invite other countries to um, champion it with us, working through the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, through um, the International Organization for Migration, and, and some of the best NGOs. Um, the other two observations is, I was just in Geneva talking to Stefan de Mastura's team that is pursuing peace in Syria. And what they had done was, they have a room set aside in the Palais that's off to the side of, um, but not, not very far, everybody goes to the same cafeteria to get coffee, of the peace negotiations where women's groups from Syria are invited to set up camp and have a headquarters and mix and mingle. It's, it, this is probably too early to even talk about this, but I thought how very smart to, it, 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 you know, there's not enough women probably on the, on the actual uh, delegations. There are some, but there's not a lot. But then the women are there. And also, in this room, the women represent different factions. So guess, guess who's you know, making the most progress on peace talks? Are these people from the civil society groups who are sharing a room and sharing information and trying to influence uh, people down the hall. So just by virtue of being in the building and down the hall, I think they have made strides in getting women's voices in. And my final tip is to do whatever Zainab Bangura tells you to, because I think that alone would make a big difference in the world. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm listening very carefully. Uh, so what do you want me to do? <laughs> uh, okay, we're going to take a few questions uh, from the audience. Uh, what I would suggest is that we'll probably take about three or four questions. And if you have someone specifically... Good morning. Ministre de la Promotion de la Femme. Good morning. Good morning. En fait, c'est juste pour faire euh, un témoignage sur la résolution 1325 des Nations Unies sur les femmes, la paix et la sécurité. La Côte d'Ivoire a été le premier pays africain à avoir fait un plan d'action de cette résolution parce que nous avons vu que c'était très important. On ne peut pas parler de paix sans parler de développement. On ne peut pas parler de développement sans parler de la femme. Et quand on a fait le plan d'action, les Nations Unies n'avaient pas encore demandé à tous les pays de faire un plan d'action. Qu'est-ce qu'on a fait On s'est dit, la première des choses, il faut faire participer les femmes elles-mêmes au processus de paix et de développement. Ça, c'était l'axe 1. Parce que les femmes sont victimes, mais elles sont actrices. Et elles savent ce que vivent leurs soeurs. Donc, il faut les mettre au plus de décisions. 1. Le deuxième axe, c'était sur les violences sexuelles. Comment faut coordonner depuis 2007 voilà, ce projet avec les, la justice, avec la police, la gendarmerie, on a puni des auteurs parce qu'on a mis une stratégie pour moi le faire. 
Le troisième élément, c'était que même s'il y a des violences, les questions d'éducation, les questions de santé continuent. Il faut prendre en compte le genre dans tous ces secteurs. On l'a fait et le dernier point, c'était la coordination. Et là, on a quand même un souci au niveau de la coordination parce que les ministères de la femme n'ont souvent pas de moyens pour pouvoir coordonner. Alors, ma question est la suivante. Comment est-ce que, euh, je pose aux deux premières que je connais parce qu'on a travaillé sur la question, comment vous soutenez les ministères en charge de la coordination de ce programme, surtout que nous, on a été le premier pays, donc un exemple. Et puis, qu'est-ce que vous pouvez faire vraiment réellement pour que les autres pays puissent avancer sur la question Parce que sans la paix, il n'y a pas de femmes, sans les femmes, il n'y a pas de développement. We are working to make sure that we have changes, the change we want to see. Um, agenda 2063 has priority. It's another agenda in Africa, but linking it to the global agenda of the UN. So what we do in the African Union is to, last year was the year of women's empowerment. This year is the year of women's human rights, and next year. So we are looking priority and putting um, women at the center of the development. Of course, implementation will lie to on the government, like Cote d'Ivoire, to put in place plan of action. So then, USIT, the World Bank, all of us, UN, come together to support and make sure that those best practices that we see, because it's doable. We have seen that it has worked in many places. Either it is centers uh, for women, either it is uh, on the, on the um, what's happening in Pansy Hospital, for example, is a good practice, what we have seen today, to reconstruct the body of the women. All the justice issues in Rwanda, for example, the Gajaja, so it's doable. When you take it one by one, you can see African member states who are implementing. Cote d'Ivoire is another one. So the whole issue is how do we replicate those good practices from one place to another? It's doable. We are putting member states their responsibility. For example, at the AU level, right now we are working on a framework for accountability and reporting. We want to measure the progress in the continent. Is it working? Is Cote d'Ivoire doing it? Is Senegal, my country, doing preventing, for example? Because we need to invest more in prevention. For example, in election, for example, we see so much violence happening during elections right now in Africa and other parts of the world. So we say, how do we prevent now rather than curing? So we want to share those best practices, invest on the population, on the women and the children, and I think we will be able to respond to the rural. My work at the AU is really to go at the grassroots, to meet the women in there and bring it back to the African Union. For example, having interaction, dialogue with the Peace and Security Council, who are the main one taking the decision on the ground. So I think that there is possibility um, to, to, to achieve not just peace and security but development and I think it's become a priority in our continent as well. Thank you. Thank you. The introduction to that, to kind of get this conversation going, and this is what he said. Uh, he said that we hear that girls in Africa don't have the same opportunities as boys to get a decent education, that discrimination is shutting women out of their jobs and assets they need to provide a better standard of living for their families that the benefits of economic growth are being wiped out because women are having too many children and the thousands of women are dying in childbirth because they don't have access to basic health care. And while all these things are true, they also hide something that you rarely hear, that Africa has been making significant progress and even has a thing or two to teach the rest of the world. This was in an op-ed that was published in February and uh, I just want us to uh, open this discussion by each one of you making a statement about has there been progress? Are barriers being open? 
Is there progress that we are seeing on the continent? Is there an untold story? And uh, we want to just start uh, with uh, the Honorable Minister from Cote d'Ivoire, FRC, what do you see? Uh, has there been change on the continent in terms of opportunities uh, for women and girls? La parole de la Côte d'Ivoire nous dit qu'effectivement, il y a eu des changements. En matière de genre, quand on parle de changement, on regarde d'abord le pouvoir social. Et ce pouvoir social, on parle de l'éducation. Quand je prends le cas de la Côte d'Ivoire, on a pris des lois pour scolariser aussi bien les filles que les garçons. Et aujourd'hui, à l'éducation préscolaire, les filles sont à 51% et ainsi de suite dans l'éducation. Quand on prend le cas de la santé, on a fait beaucoup d'actions pour les femmes, pour qu'elles puissent en sortir, par les sensibilisations, bébés à vie de vie à SIDA. Quand on prend le niveau économique, on a donné des moyens aux femmes. On a eu un fonds qu'on appelle le fonds d'appui aux femmes de Côte d'Ivoire et qui aujourd'hui permet aux femmes de faire des activités génératrices de revenus. Quand on parle du pouvoir politique, parce que les changements, c'est aussi le pouvoir politique, on est passé de 4 à 9 femmes, donc de 15 à 25 de femmes au poste de prise de décision. Et je vous assure que la première fois qu'on a eu une femme générale dans l'armée, les conditions des violences sexuelles et la paix sont en train de changer, Madame Bongoura nous a dit à New York. C'est ça, ça qui est important. Et quand on prend aussi au Conseil économique et social, on est passé de 17 à 30 Donc il y a des changements. Mais les changements sont encore plus importants quand on va sur le terrain en milieu rural. Il y a un programme qu'on a fait pour les femmes. On est parti de l'eau potable, simplement. L'État installait des pompes et de l'électricité. Et on se rendait compte qu'à un moment donné, il n'y avait plus d'eau, la pompe était en panne et les femmes repartaient au marigot. On a sensibilisé les hommes et les femmes pour que tout le monde ait accès à l'eau. Et aujourd'hui, dans ces, dans ces régions, tout le monde a accès à l'eau. Le temps qu'on prenait pour aller au Marigo a été réduit. L'éducation de la petite fille a été favorisée. Les questions d'hygiène, les femmes se sont regroupées même pour transformer la production locale et en petite industrie. Donc, il y a ces gens de, 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 de cas depuis le milieu rural jusqu'à la prise de décision. Et comme on le dit, il n'y a pas la femme, il y a les femmes à un certain niveau qu'il faut pouvoir accompagner pour qu'on passe à l'autonomisation. Merci, Honorable Minister. Uh, it's so encouraging.